Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter number four, we're in American heresy tonight. Before we get into the topic for this evening's sermon, Deuteronomy, this is Moses speaking here. So Deuteronomy is basically Moses giving, he's been speaking for several chapters, and he's going to continue speaking to the children of Israel. It's basically, um, Deuteronomy means the law again. So he's basically giving a final warning um, to the children of Israel before they go into the promised land. So he's not, as he says in Deuteronomy chapter four, He's not going with them. We know why um, that is, but he's not, you know, God said that he's not going to go over the Jordan. That's when Joshua um, took over, and we see the book of Joshua detail, um, kind of the handoff there, and Joshua taking the children of Israel into the promised land. But, I mean, there's about 50 sermons just in this chapter alone. But he, Moses is giving some warnings here to the children of Israel before they go over into the promised land, even though Moses is not going with them. So he's kind of giving his final um, warning um, to the children of Israel. Look down at verse number 26 before we start the sermon tonight. I mean, just uh, a couple things here. I mean, I don't know how people can miss that, you know, the children of Israel being in the promised land was a strict condition on them following the word of God, the statutes that Moses is literally giving them again right here. Okay, look at verse 26, if you don't believe me. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land. Wherever you go unto Jordan to possess it, and ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall be utterly destroyed. He's literally telling them, you're going to go over there, and you're going to, you know, you're going to, the Lord is going to, you know, I mean, what is it? Look at all the things he says here. He's like, those people are stronger than you. You know, I'm just going to paraphrase the whole chapter for you here in two minutes. But he's like, those people are stronger than you. The Lord's going to give you the victory. But if it, then you abandon the Lord, and you start worshiping the gods that they worship and all these things, He's like, you know, then you're going to be few in a land of all these powerful people and God's not going to be there for you and you're going to perish off the land, all right? Because what was the thing that allowed them to get the victory when they went into the land? It's that the Lord fought for them, all right? Whether the Lord was on their side was the variable that meant victory or defeat, all right? So look at verse number 27. It says, now he's talking about the curse that's going to happen to you if, you know, you abandon the Lord. Here he says, and if the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, you shall be left few in number among the heathen, and whither the Lord shall lead you. So you're going to be amongst these powerful people. They, he says they're more powerful than you are, and you're going to be there few compared to them. And then it says, and ye shall serve gods, lowercase g. It's like, look at this curse that's going to come upon them. The work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. So he's saying, like, you're just going to become, like, servants to, like, a tree. <laughs> you're going to become, like, these people that just worship rocks, you know, and just, you know, that's one of the, the, the ironies of mankind right there, or the, the, the funny things about mankind is left alone, they'll start literally worshiping a piece of wood or a moon or the stars, as, you know, he says earlier in the chapter. So tonight's topic of the American Heresy series is, ma the main topic of tonight is going to be the religion of Hinduism, all right, Hinduism. Now, Hinduism, you're going to see, I'm going to talk about um, Sikhism and Hinduism together, but, and I'll kind of point out the differences. And I was actually going to do a separate sermon on Buddhism, but it's so much the same that I think it would just be a huge waste of time and kind of get boring. So I'll try to just touch on that a little bit tonight as well. But one of the claims about Hinduism, and I think that it's interesting that the Bible brings this up, is one of the claims about Hinduism and their scriptures is that it's one of the oldest religions um, on the face of the earth. Agree. Agree. Because it's as old as idol worship itself. So what you can see here from this curse that, this curse that Moses is warning them about, it's saying, what is he saying? If you abandoned the Lord, the one true God, you are going to end up worshiping rocks and trees and moons and stars and all this. Like, like, you're going to end up worshiping the creation, not the creator. It's a curse. It's a curse. So we could just deduce from that curse right there that as long as men have been abandoning the Lord, this type of thing existed. 
So you can see why Hinduism and this, this religion that has so many different gods and just lowercase g was what we would call those gods that are, that are not gods. They're just works of men's hands. They're just paintings. They're just things that men have you know, invented themselves. It's literally a curse from the Lord God Almighty because they've abandoned him and they've turned to these things. So Hinduism's old. Agree. It's as old as man... You know, it's as old as Cain. It's as old as man abandoning the truth. The truth of the one true God. So we're going to talk about Hinduism tonight. There's a lot of Hinduism in our area here, especially in West Fresno. There's a lot of Hinduism. More so in this area, it's Sikhs, not so much Hinduism. But I'm going to kind of explain to you the difference. So Hinduism is kind of the... You can kind of look at it like Hinduism is, is the Catholic Church and the Sikhs are like the Protestants. You can, they came out of, you know, the, the Hindu religion. So that's why you'll see um, so much similarities uh, between the two. All right. So, look, Hinduism is generally this, I'll just kind of break it down for you. They believe, they believe in, Hinduism can believe in many gods. Most Hindus believe in many gods. And, but there's one big God called Brahman where that it, that this God is not, he's not everywhere and all powerful. He is everything kind of thing. So they kind of create, um, this one main God that is the creation. Whereas the Bible is very clear that God is not the creation. He is the creator. He made the creation. All right. The, the scriptures of Hinduism are called the Vedas. That's their, their, their scriptures that are cla they're claimed to be so old. And look, I, I don't have any problem with that, that they're old. They're thousands of years old. Um, another uh, concept in Hinduism that's kind of a main construct is Dharma. I don't know if maybe you've heard that in pop culture, this word Dharma before. But that's kind of the, the ethics of the Hindu um, culture. You know, this idea that you should do right, that you should, you know, you should be a righteous person. You should perform the moral law. It's basically this duty, the dharma to Hinduism is this duty to do the right thing. And you're going to see, look, I, I'm just going to, you already know, but I'm just going to give it away. It's just super works-based. It's like, that's all it is, is just works-based. But there's two things that I want to point out that are unique about Hinduism that flow into Sikhism and Buddhism that we have not talked about before. So they do believe, the Hindus believe in the immortal soul. Okay, they believe in the immortal soul, and you're going to, maybe I should have done this one before Scientology, but they believe in the immortal soul in the sense that your soul is immortal and just reincarnated into another being or another creature. Okay, then they believe in the moksha, which is basically the, the, um, the ultimate immortal state. You know, this is, if you've ever heard of uh, Nirvana, not, the, not the, the rock band, okay, not the wicked, evil, um, you know, band from the, what was it, the 80s or 90s, that people still wear t-shirts today? I mean, like, the guy committed suicide and, like, was a devil worshiper, and it's like, what in the world? But anyway, not to, go, but Nirvana is the Buddhist state of moksha. It's like you've, you've done so good in your life that you finally get to this state where you are one with God and, you know, it's the ultimate state. Like you got, you know, if I do bad as, you know, as a, as a Buddhist, you know, I'll come back as a bug or something bad, right? And, you know, if I do good, I'll come back as something better and then I just get better and better and better and better and then nirvana, all right? So Hinduism is the same thing, but her, Hinduism is kind of the original gangster of this uh, theology. Hinduism was kind of the, the start of it, and Buddhism came out of Hinduism. I think it was like the 5th century Buddhism came out of Hinduism. So that, you know, the guy that became Buddha, I can't remember his name, but the guy that became the Buddha, you know, he, of course, he got to the, he got to that level, right? <laughs> it's kind of like, it's kind of like L. Ron Hubbard, right? I mean, are you noticing a pattern here? It's like, you get to level eight in Scientology, and they're like, oh yeah, you know, you're still all messed up. And you're like, all right, well, where's level nine? I'm here to write another check. And they're like, it doesn't exist. But L. Ron Hubbard got to 15. You're like, what? So, you know, you got these religious leaders in these, you know, false uh, religions that achieve these high states, and that's the idea. So, they do, they will say they believe in the immortal soul, but they believe in reincarnation. All that to say that. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And the idea of reincarnation is to reach this top state where you become one with the 
the Brahma, God, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. All right. Now, Hinduism originated in you know northern India and it, you know thousands of years ago, I guess. And Sikhism in the 15th century, Sikhism, what we see around here, that came out of Hinduism in 1500 and something. Okay, so that's where you know Sikhism came from. Now, Sikhism has a little bit of a, a couple of twists on um, Hinduism. The, the main difference between Sikhism and Hinduism is that Sikhism will claim to be monotheistic. So they're, um, they're going to be like, no, there's not all these different gods. There's only one, and that's it. But they're still very, like, all-inclusive and universalist, if, if that makes sense. So there's Standing from the Bible, looking at both of these, there doesn't seem to be a lot of difference from a biblical standpoint. But I will say this, just, just having soul winning experience with Hindus and with Sikhs, Hindus are more likely to let you preach the gospel to them because, um, because of the fact that they believe. And I'm not saying that they're more receptive to get saved. I mean, I've seen, I've seen Hindus saved. We have seen Hindus saved. But I'm not saying they're more likely to get saved. I'm just saying they're more likely to listen because they believe in this plethora of gods. They kind of believe this idea. And they'll even tell you at the door. They'll be like, oh, we believe that all, you know, it's, it, they kind of believe this philosophy that we all call God a different name. You can have your own gods and I can have my own gods. And like Hindus, some will have six gods. And they say that there's up to like 33 million different gods that you could have. I don't know, you know where they come up with that number, but the point is there's no set amount of gods. So that's why you'll see Hindus that are just like open to hearing about Jesus and the gospel. And hey, if somebody's open to hearing the gospel, I'm going to tell it to them. All right? So, but there are some things that we need to kind of check, you know, some boxes we need to check when we know somebody comes from this type of background. All right? All right, so 15th century, we see Sikhism come out of you know, it's kind of the, the reformation of, uh, of, of Hinduism, right? And there was a man named Guru Nanak. So if you've ever heard the term guru, you know, gurus comes from this idea of this religious expert or this religious teacher in Sikhism or Hinduism. And this one um, named Nanak started the Sikh religion, all right? The Sikh religion has, throughout history, has had 10 main gurus, I guess. But basically, Sikhism is this. The fundamental beliefs, I'm just going to read this to you, of Sikhism are articulated in the sacred scripture, you know, Guru Granth Sahib, include faith and meditation on the name of one creator. So it's mono, monotheistic, all right? But then it teaches this, and you compare this with Christianity. Unity of all humankind, engaging in a selfless service, striving for social justice, and for the benefit and prosperity of all, and honest conduct and, li and livelihood while living a householder's life. So this guru is worshipped as the supreme authority of Sikhism and considered to be the final and perpetual guru of Sikhism. And as the first guru of Sikhism, this nanak contributed a total of 974 of these uh, proverbs or hymns or whatever they want to call it. But anyway, the point is, it was invented in the 15th century by this guy. And the main difference is that it's monotheistic versus polytheistic or, you know, whatever, however many they want. But let me just say this. And many of you probably thought this when I talked about, you know, the Scientology last week where it was invented like in the 50s. You know, a religion that is invented in the 1500s, you have to ask yourself, and I don't understand why more people don't ask themselves, well, what about the people before this? All right, this is why it is so important that you understand that Baptists are not Protestants. Baptists, we did not, we did not, if you read any Wikipedia article or anything on Baptists and most things on the internet about Baptists, they're going to tell you that Baptists came out, uh, you know, of the, of the Reformation in 1600 something or whatever. The point is, Baptists are not Protestants. And this, again, is why, the, you know, it's really why doctrine is so important as well. I mean, there's many reasons doctrine is important, and ultimately because it's the truth. But doctrine is so important because we could never see the trail of Baptists if it wasn't for doctrine. Because Baptists, you know, we call ourselves fundamental Baptists today, but Baptists have had many names, you know, throughout history and down to, you know, Jesus Christ. 
You can definitely trace the doctrines that we hold to in the Bible back to groups of people back, all the way back to Jesus Christ. And this, again, doctrine is important, and it's also why the trail of blood is so important. Because these trails, these people, these Waldensians and, and all these different names of people that, that you know, held to these doctrines that we hold to today, that many times their doctrines and their history was written down in terms of their persecution. And that's why the trail of blood and doctrine is so important. Because look, if, if I'm following something that came out of a truth that came out of the 16th century, my question is, well, what about before that? It's, this isn't something, we're not following something that was invented by some guy that was invented by Martin Luther, you know, a few hundred years ago. We are following the doctrine of John the Baptist. We are following the doctrine of Jesus Christ. We are following the doctrine of the apostles as they're written in the Bible. And the trail of blood and those doctrines that those people in that trail of blood were persecuted for, they document the proof of that. All right? They document that history. But that's why it's so important. You know, that's one of the reasons that, you know, once we start giving up doctrine, think of it this way. Once we start giving up doctrine, when you think about the trail of blood and you think about all the different martyrs throughout history, all the way back to Jesus Christ, and you think about how we are connected to all of them, then you think about if we would start giving up doctrine today. And guess what? You know what? Would you become unsaved if you just like put your head down and just like, you know, compromised on all your doctrine? No, you would not become unsaved. But you know what? You would be unrecognizable to history. We, as a church, as a Bible-believing ministry, would not be able to be recognized by the people 200 years down the line. When they look back and say, where were the Christians then? Oh, well, I guess they just had all their, their heads under their, their desk, or they were just hiding at that time. But that is how, and that's why Hebrews 11 is in the Bible. That's why Hebrews 12, verse number 1, is in the Bible. So we can look back at these martyrs and at these persecutions and see, you know what, there was the doctrine. You know, the martyr's mirror is all people being, ba or being, being persecuted basically for being Baptist, for refusing to add even baptism to the gospel, to refusing to add anything to the gospel. But that's why it's so important. So anyway, all that to say this, Sikhism was invented in the 15th century. Now, let's talk about the aspects, these two main aspects I want to talk about tonight about Hinduism and Sikhism, that it shares, okay? So, the soul is immortal, but it's only immortal through reincarnation, all right? So, being reborn, you know, you, you live a life, and you live this works-based life, and if you do good, you're reborn into something that is closer to God, closer to divinity, or you're reborn into something that is further away, all right? Sikhs believe that heaven and hell are also both in this world where everyone reaps the fruit of karma. They refuse to refer to good and evil stages of life respectively and can be lived now. They refer to good and evil stages of life respectively and, and can be lived now and here during our life on earth. All right, so look, you, according to karma, karma is this idea that you reap what you sow. And we'll get there in just a minute. But first of all, you're just reincarnated again and again. Hindu deities are the gods and goddesses in Hinduism. Deities in Hinduism are as diverse as traditions, and a Hindu can choose to be polytheistic, pantheistic, monotheistic. You can about tell where a lot of this stuff goes to. All right? This is why you see a lot of people that are in the reprobate culture today that are, you know, just like they just hate the God of the Bible. You see that a lot of these people like embrace things like Buddhism, embrace things like Hinduism. So, like I said, in Hinduism, there's at least six gods, but you could max out at 33 million, all right? But basically, if you go down to Deuteronomy chapter 27, or Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse number 27, we see that there's nothing new under the sun. It says, And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and you shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you, and there you shall serve gods, the works of men's hands, wood, stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. So the idea here, folks, is that all these idols and all these gods, they're not gods. I mean, you know this, but they're not gods. They're, they're dumb idols, meaning they can't hear anything. They're just a piece of wood, just a rock. And you're going to end up, you know, a curse from God for not following him is to become an idol 
worshiper. I mean, that's when you just think of the logic of it, it's, if it wasn't a curse from God, it would be really hard to understand. I mean, could you not, I mean, it would be really hard to understand how, you know, you just imagine God looking down here and seeing, you know, people abandon him and then just on their own worshiping the dirt or worshiping the rock or, a, you know, a cloud or the sun or whatever. I mean, it's a very strange thing. It's one of the strangest things about man. But really, we see here kind of it's explained it's a curse from God. All right. So now, let's talk about this reincarnation, this immortal soul of the Hindu, of the Sikh, and really of the Buddhist as well. And it's really based on this idea of karma, okay? I'm going to read for you uh, a definition of karma out of, you know, um, some Hindu uh, explanation website. I can't remember what the site was. But it says, basically, karma, you have to think about it this way. So here's their words. Karma is a concept of Hinduism which describes a system in which the beneficial effects are derived from past beneficial actions and harmful effects from past harmful actions, creating a system of actions and reactions throughout a soul, throughout a soul's reincarnated lives, forming a cycle of rebirth. So again, you live a bad life and you get reincarnated into something bad. I couldn't find like a scale of things. I was really looking forward to seeing something like that. I couldn't find anything like that. But works-based, you know, works-based religions never have scales like that, right? If the Bible was truly works-based, that's what we would have. We would have scales. We would have sin rankings. We would have all these things because God doesn't want us just to wonder if we're going to go to heaven. He wants us to know what it takes, all right? That ye may know that you have eternal life. So you're reincarnated according to how good you are. Now in pop culture, you'll hear people use the word karma all the time. What do they, what do they use the word karma? You see something bad happens to somebody that everybody thinks is you know, a big jerk, and they're just like, yeah, see, that's karma. Well, what they're doing is they're quoting some Hindu belief. Basically, karma, you know what it means? It means you get what you deserve. That's kind of the idea that it portrays, all right? But turn to Galatians chapter 6. Karma is kind of a ripoff of biblical reality, all right? Look at Galatians chapter 6. Look at verse number 7. I mean, karma is basically saying you get what you deserve. The only difference is, is that, you know, they add this reincarnation and say you'll, you'll pay in another body or another life or another lower life form or whatever that is. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7, the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, this is more of an application of this to the Christian, as Paul's talking to the the church uh, at Corinth, he says, but I, this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So this is kind of this concept applied to the soul winner right here. All right, so there's this concept. It's like, hey, if you never go soul winning, you're never going to get anybody saved. <laughs> hey, if you don't, you know, live the Christian life, you know, you're not going to get bear fruit in the Christian life. But if you go out there and you just sow like all the time, it's like you are going to see fruit. That's a nice little guarantee for the Christian right there. You go and you do what God wants you to do. You do what you're told in the Bible and you're going to be what? You're going to be extra saved? No, you're saved just the same. You're going to bear a lot more fruit. You're going to reap a lot more. You're going to, you're going to, if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. But the whole point is this. Whether in this life or the next, in Galatians chapter 6, 7, is saying, you know, whatsoever man, a man soweth, that also shall he reap. In this life or the next, the Bible says that everybody's going to get what they have coming to them. The Bible is very clear about that. But the problem is, is that the Bible teaches that everybody's going to be judged. Everyone's going to get what they have coming to them. The, the saved is going to get what they have coming to them on this earth. God's going to punish you on this earth, you're going you're gonna to reap that punishment, you know, in your life here on earth if you don't do what God says. But like everybody else, do they just get off the hook? No, the Bible is very clear, and a lot of people have this question, you know, they're just like, especially when you tell them that salvation is free, and all you have to do is trust in Jesus, and you'll be saved for eternity, you're sealed, you can never lose that salvation. A lot of people have 
a hard time with that because they're just like, well, why does God just let all these bad people get away with all these bad things? It doesn't seem fair. Well, yeah, it is true that the Bible, or that, that people in this life that are not saved, wicked people that hate the Lord, they're going to get away with a lot of stuff here on earth. But everyone will get what's coming to them. The difference between what the Bible says and what the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Sikhs teach is that everyone that, you know, deserves punishment that is not saved is going to pay in hell. Not in the life of a puppy or whatever. All right? You're going to pay. And look, you're going to pay. The reality of the Bible is much, much worse than anything that this religion could possibly teach you. Because look, it's, it's, called, it's literally called everlasting destruction in 1 Thessalonians. It's destruction that will last forever. There's no, you know, there's no second chance at it. You know, I mean, basically reincarnation, it, the problem is, is it, I mean, the problem is it's not true. But I mean, it, it gives people this idea that no matter what, maybe I don't need to seek truth because if I'm wrong, I can just try again. There is no try again. There is no try again. That's why the, in Luke chapter 16, that story is in the Bible with us. I mean, if the, the guy, the rich man in Luke 16, he's like, hey, I want to get out of here. He's like, sorry, you're still, that's it. You cannot pass from there to us or us to you. We can't come get you and you can't get out. Go tell my family. I already gave them the Bible. They wouldn't listen even if you came back. So look, there is no second chance. It's... it's it's extra wicked in that case. That it, yes, it's a works-based religion, like many, all other religions other than true Christianity are, but it teaches this idea that you're going to get another shot at it, and another shot at it, and another shot at it. And that is a super wicked seed to plant in people's heads. Because you know what? They won't be seeking the truth. You know, that, you know what that is? That's Satan trying to take away the urgency. It's Satan trying to take away the fear of the wrath of God. And guess what? The fear of the wrath of God is hardwired in. But religions like this will cover it. And they will, they will block that fear that God wrote in your heart. Turn to Hosea chapter 8. Turn to Hosea chapter number 8. Hosea chapter 8, the Bible says, look at verse number 7. In Hosea chapter 8, Hosea chapter 8, look at verse, actually go to verse number 4. Hosea chapter 8 and verse number 4. The Bible says, They have set up kings, but not, not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and their gold have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. Thy calf, O Samaria, has cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it, er will it be ere they attain to innocency? Far from Israel was it also that the workmen made it, therefore it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. And then here we see in verse number 7, it says, For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stock, but the bud shall yield no meal, so if it be yield, the strangers shall swallow it up. Talking about a, a nation that turns against the Lord here. They've sown the wind, they're going to reap the whirlwind. Nations are judged on this earth. It's interesting, though, that it's a calf. They're always worshiping a cow. Why is that? Now, I actually looked up, and, and Hindus don't actually, because a lot of people say, oh, Hindus, you know, they don't eat beef. I mean, most of the Hindus that I've worked with, they, they literally, they don't eat, um, they don't eat beef at all. Um, but I guess they don't really, you know, actually worship the cow. It's just this sacred animal um, to them. I'll read you a, a little quote here. It says, Hindus see the cow as a particular generous, gener, generous, docile creature, one that gives more to human beings than she takes from them. The cow, they say, produces five things, and they're really big on these five things. Milk, cheese, butter, so those are the good things, and then urine and dung, those are the bad things, right? Those are bad things. The first three are eaten and used in worship of the Hindu gods, while the last two can be used in re religious devotion and in penance or burned for fuel. So it's talking about how they will use, so this is why they, they reverence the cow so much. I just think it's interesting that people end up worshiping cows in the Bible all the time, all these different gods, Baal, and all these other gods. Are, they're, always, they're always a calf. They're always a cow. It's almost like the same person is behind it. Yeah, sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
So here we've got this idea that cows are sacred. They produce these things. I remember um, during, I don't know if you all remember this, but during the COVID-19 thing, there was a big thing in India. And of course, it says here that, you know, all of these things are used by Hindus, even the last two. The last two can be used in devotion or penance ceremonies. I remember there was some of these gurus. I don't remember if they were Sikh or Hindu, um, but there was these gurus in India, and there was this big, like, like thing where they were all worried about the health of people in India because they were smearing themselves with cow dung to protect against, you know, COVID-19, right? And I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, so there was like, um, there was all these articles about these people in India um, doing this. But look, I mean, the, the Hindu majority people in India use cow dung and urine for their wellness and cure of Ill illness since ancient times. It's a normal thing that they've done because this cow is a sacred thing. I mean, anytime I've been covered in, in cow dung, it's been on accident, all right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's been not, a, you know, not something that I wanted at the time, all right? See the sermon from this morning. All right, but that's the whole thing on cows, all right? They don't technically worship the cow, um, but, you know, it's this high thing for them, and most of them do not eat um, beef. All right, so the first thing that I really wanted to point out about Hinduism was this idea of, they'll say, oh, we believe the soul is immortal, but it's this idea of reincarnation that is driven by this machine, karma. So they believe that, like, karma is kind of like, this is my words, not any, any Hindu's words, but karma is like this machine in motion. So it's kind of this thing that just automatically handles, you know, the reincarnation cycle, all right? But the next thing, and you will notice this soul winning, the next thing about Hinduism especially is this idea of universalism. And you can even see that in the, the description, even though Sikhism, Sikhism was theoretically monotheistic, you could see that it was very open to things and wanting to bring all humankind together and all these different things. So it's this idea of universalism that you can just have whatever God you want and we all just call God a different name. This, all, this idea came from Hinduism. There's a lot of people who are not even religious that have this type of belief. Like, oh, the, the Muslims, because they grew up there, and the Hindus, because they grew up there, and the, you know, the Chinese are, are into Buddhism because that's where they grew up, and then you have the Christians over here in Europe, and that's how they grew up. They're all worshiping the same God. They just call him different names. Okay? That is one of the ideas of Hinduism. And this is why you will see Hindus that are open to Hearing. They're doing it for two reasons. When you walk up to a Hindu's door and they're open to hearing the gospel, there's, there's two possible reasons they're doing it. Number one, they want to just add a belief. They want to just add a God to what they believe. And number two, they're, they're being nice. They're, be, they're doing a good work in, in, their, in their mind. Okay? They're being open to any form of God. Okay? It's this idea that we all worship the same God. He's just got different ways of revealing himself to different people and different cultures and different parts of the world. Turn to Luke chapter 12. But the Bible is the opposite. And Christians need to remember this today. This is what Christianity is losing today. You know, other than, you know, the true gospel, even Christians that have the true gospel, churches that are preaching the right gospel, they're losing this divisiveness today. They're losing this idea. They're like, oh, we just all need to come together and stop, you know, we, need, we all need to forget our differences. We all need to forget our differences and quit, you know, uh, you know, nitpicking on all these things like God, the gospel and like repenting your sins. Aren't you kind of like, you know, uh, splitting hairs on that one? It's like, no. Look what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12. I'll read for you John 14, 6, which is everyone probably has memorized. It says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. In Luke 12, 51 Jesus himself, listen to this. Jesus himself says, suppose that I'm come together to give, come to give peace on earth. I tell you, nay, but rather division. This is Jesus talking, saying that to be a Christian, to follow me, you must divide. Christians need to relearn this today. Jesus divides people. There is only, we just studied in John chapter 10, there is only one way. There is many people that are going to try to crawl up the building and go through the windows. It's like, no, Jesus is the door, and the only way is through the door. 
Jesus is the only way. So all these religions that we talk about, all these religions, whether they are inclusive or not inclusive of other religions, all these religions that we talk about, if they do not hold to the gospel of the Bible and someone dies in that religion, they are going to spend an eternity in hell. That is divisive. That if you don't trust in Jesus Christ, that's why you have to say when you're out and you're out preaching the gospel, when you're out talking to people, and, and they say, well, faith in God. How do, you, how do you know you're going to heaven? You just have to have faith in God. Hey, what is God's name? Does God have a name? You'll get all kinds of different answers once you ask that question. Well, it, it doesn't matter what God's name is. Yes, it does matter. The door is Jesus Christ. There is no other name. There's no other name. All other ways lead to destruction. That is a divisive thing. But guess what? We're not here to lie to people. We're not here to tell people that, oh, it's great, and, and just you can believe whatever you want, and you, don't, you can believe in works, and you can believe in repenting your sins, and you can believe in lordship, salvation, and you can believe that, you know, you can believe in tulip, and you can believe in all these different things. It's fine. Those are all, you know, whatever. As long as you say Jesus in there somewhere, you're fine. No, we're not here to lie to people. We will divide people as we need to for them to know the truth. Because how loving is it to not tell somebody the truth and, and have them not be saved? That's why Jesus said that. I came to divide. Because when you tell people that, no, uh, it's not one of these 33 million gods. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That's it. That's the only way. That is divisive. And people, there's going to be people that do not like that. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. So look, I mean, it's not complicated. It's, I'm sure it is a lot more complicated if you want to dig more into it. But it's a works-based religion. It's based on reincarnation and the idea of karma. Uh, Sikhism, Buddhism, and, and Hinduism, all the same. Because Sikhism, you know, came out of uh, Hinduism in the 15th century. Buddhism came out of Hinduism way earlier, I think like the 5th century. So Buddhism is actually older than Sikhism. But it's all the same thing. It's do good and you're going to get somewhere better. It's all the same idea. All right, now look, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, and I want to kind of show you something a little bit different here. You, you hear in this sermon series, one of the things that I wanted you to see in this sermon series as we go through a lot of these different heresies is many people involved first of all they're ridiculous you will listen to these descriptions of these different religions these pagan religions these cults whatever it is and it's just it's full of ridiculousness and but guess what you are not the only one that thinks that it's ridiculous. It is not only the saved Christian that thinks that that Scientology story that I told you last week is ridiculous. But I want to kind of show you tonight how ridiculousness is part of the design of false religion. It's baked into the cake by Satan, the inventor of these false religions. That's why they kind of all look the same. Not only are they all works-based religions, every single one I preach on, you're like, oh, it always comes back to that. It always comes back to works-based works -based salvation. It's always the same thing. But then you see certain things like the heathen, the pagans, worshiping the cows, worshiping the calves, all these different things. They're sacred in this one. It's all because, you know, all, you know airplanes look the same because they, they were designed by the same type of people. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just all designed by Satan. But ridiculousness is baked into the cake on purpose. You say, who would believe these ridiculous things that you could be reincarnated into something else. Who even thought of this stuff? But look, here's what we have to understand, folks. A lot of people that are Hindus and Sikhs and all these different religions, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, whatever it is, all these different ridiculous false religions, a lot of these people were born into these religions. Just like I was born into the Lutheran religion. So we always need to remember that, like, look, we love these people. We love these people that were born into these religions, and we want to reach them with the truth of the Bible. But the point is, is that they have ridiculousness baked into their cake on 
purpose. I mean, you just think about the reincarnation. You think about um, the, the Dianetics book, a, a psychological book written by a science fiction author. You think about that whole story. You think about the, the, the Book of Mormon and the ridiculous things in the Book of Mormon, just like that there were submarines after the Tower of Babel and like just crazy stuff, just ridiculous things. You think about the Koran where it says the earth is flat, Muhammad split the moon in two and then put it back together. I mean, just like all this crazy, ridiculous stuff, meteors are... are if you see a meteor, it's because it's a star that was shot by Satan or whatever. I mean, it's something like that. I, maybe I misquoted it. But the point is, they're ridiculous books with ridiculous teachings. You say, why is that? It's the same reason for multiple Bible versions. Follow me here. You say, why are they all so ridiculous? Because Satan, he doesn't want to just corrupt the people that were born into these religions. He wants to corrupt people that were not in those religions from finding the truth. So what did God do? God gave every man, no matter who this man is, no matter what this person is, when they're born, they had this law written in their heart. They had the proof of creation all around them. In Romans 2.15, God wrote the law in their heart. They have this desire to seek the Lord. You don't believe me? I was just talking to the girls that went out soul winning today, and they had this child following them around, this eight-year-old child. Can you read me the Bible again? Can you read me some more of the Bible? Can you read me the Bible? They just inherently know that the Bible is truth. No one showed her anything out of the Bible before. They just inherently know. Why? Because God wrote that in her heart. Guess what she's not saying? Can you show me the Book of Mormon? Can you show me the Shiva? Can you show me the, the Dianetics book that L. Ron Hubbard wrote? No, she's saying, can you show me the Bible? She doesn't know what's in the Bible. Her heart's telling her that the Bible's true and she wants to hear the Bible. That has to be broken. Someone has to go out, look, and people are breaking it today. But children are a perfect example of this. So Satan makes all these religions ridiculous. So people that aren't part of any religion, that have that law written in them to seek truth in their life, they see this ridiculousness all around them. And you know what they say? Then somebody comes up to them. This is the Jehovah's Witnesses that are out knocking doors right before we get there. They see this ridiculousness. Ridiculousness. And then when the truth comes up, they're just like, oh, that's just more ridiculousness. It, it's like spiritual wolf crying. It's like the boy that cried wolf. He cried wolf so many times when there actually was a wolf. Nobody wanted to listen. It's the same theory. These people, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they come up, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't have any answers. You want to talk about ridiculous? You read the history of the Jehovah's Witnesses, it's one of the most ridiculous things you'll ever read. Leader of the Jehovah's Witnesses, that, that they deny Jesus Christ? Leader of the Jehovah's Witnesses builds a mansion, and remember this one, builds a mansion in Los Angeles? And they've, they've predicted the end times, I think, more than any other false religion out there. Like, they've picked a date and been wrong so many times. And you're just like, who's a Jehovah's Witness at this point? Who's following this point? Remember the guy in 1914 or whatever? No, it was 1920s. He goes and he builds this huge mansion. Rutherford, I think his name was, the leader of the Jehovah's Witnesses, builds this huge mansion in L.A. It's on like 100 acres. And he's like, this is for Abraham and Jacob and uh, the uh, patriarchs that are going to come back. They're coming back soon. We have to build this huge mansion for them. Imagine me standing up here and telling you this. Like, what are we going to do with this huge mansion? Well, I will live there until they, they get here. That's what happened. I mean, it's the, it's the epitome. People that aren't saved, that are looking at this from the outside, they're like, you people are all nuts for following these people. You must be out of your mind. It's as bad as Xenu the alien dictator. I mean, it's just like people look at this and they're just like, what are you, nuts? And then somebody knocks on their door. That's why they put signs on their door that says, don't bring any religion here. Because they're sick of the ridiculousness of it. Because they've seen so many ridiculous things and ridiculous people that are involved in all these ridiculous, it's baked into the cake on purpose. So somebody shows up with the truth, and they're like, man, it's all crazy. Get away from me. That's why, 
That's why even people, the, 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 but the devil's like, oh, but there's still the Bible. I still got these eight-year-old kids who want to hear the Bible. What should I do? I'll make 150 Bible versions. That's what I'll do. And then every single logical person with a brain in their head will take a book A that's a Bible and book B that's a Bible and set them next to each other and see that they say different things and be like, how could this be true? If A doesn't equal B, how could one of them equal, and they're both the same, how could they be true? That's why there's 100, 200, whatever, how many hundreds of Bible versions there are. Because he's still got this problem of the conscience that starts out with every man. So he's got to corrupt the very Bible that people are going to be seeking. And then you see what's corrupted in the Bible. I don't know. Who Jesus was? What's corrupted in the Bible? I don't know. The gospel itself? What's corrupted in the Bible? The divinity of Christ? You look at all the things that are corrupted, and it is all the things that would cause people to be saved. And then on top of that, you say, well, oh, but there's more. But there's more. You see, any person, here's another thing. Any person can open up one of these religious books, the Book of Mormon, the Koran, whatever it is, and you could read the ridiculous things that I just shot off to you. You could look at it and you could read it yourself and be like, this is ridiculous. And you just, you read two pages of any one of them and they sound, they sound, you can just see someone wrote it. it it's, I don't even know, you just open it up yourself and you'll see, you're like, this is not a spiritual book. But here's another problem. While they can open those books and they can see the ridiculousness of those books, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 14. They cannot do the same with the Bible. Because the natural man cannot understand what's in the Bible. So if there is somebody that is telling them a false thing about what's in the Bible, it's very likely that they're going to believe it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. It says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You say, who could... Who could read the Bible and think that it's foolishness? I have sat down with people who've explained that they can't understand Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 to me. They're like, gift of God, that's so confusing. They're unsaved. They're trying to understand it. And then you sit down and you have to explain the gospel to them. That's how God designed it. He designed it where someone who is saved would come down and use the Holy Spirit that is in them to preach the gospel to someone. And then they get the Holy Spirit and now they can understand the Bible. So it's not like they can just pick up the Bible like they could pick up any ridiculous book and see that it's ridiculous. But if a false prophet is telling them that it's ridiculous, that's why, I mean, that's why we are needed. That's why we are needed to go out there and spiritually discern these things with the Holy Spirit in us. It's really, we're kind of like just a, 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 a suitcase. <laughs> that rolls up to the door, you know, kind of carrying the Holy Spirit, he's kind of the important one in this situation. It's kind of like, you know, Jesus is the important one, the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit that is with us. We're kind of like the suitcase that just kind of rolls up to the door. But we're necessary. That's how God designed it. You say, why did God design it that way? You ask him when you get to heaven. But that's how it is. So, I mean, look, these ridiculous books, they're providing cover, including all the false Bible versions. They're providing cover cover of the truth. And that's a wicked thing about how ridiculous some, so we laugh about it, how ridiculous it is, but it's really a wicked thing because it's spiritually crying wolf to the world. And there really is the wrath of God out there. It's a real thing and people need to know the truth. All these things have no answers. All these ridiculous things, there's no answers there. Scientology has no answers. Hinduism has no answers. JWs, they, they don't have any answers. So look, one thing, though, all that to wrap this up. Let's take it back to Hinduism. I kind of went on a tangent there, but the reality of the Sikhs and Hindus to the soul winner is this. Because of this inclusivity of the Sikhs and because of this polytheistic universalism of the Hindus, you may be allowed to preach to them. 
You may be allowed to give the gospel to these people, but what you need to be sure of is that they understand that it is only through Jesus. That this cannot be a plus Jesus situation. It needs to be, you must repent of Hinduism and turn to Jesus Christ. It needs to be a decision that has been made. Look, and I, I've seen it happen. Typically with what? Younger people. The, the, I've seen younger people who are raised in a Hindu home saved, but they must understand that they can't just add this. Hopefully you, you mention that to everybody, but they can't just add this to all their different beliefs. But, you know, a lot of the time you're going to find out that they're just doing a good work listening to you. They're just being, you know, that um, it's just another workspace religion, and part of their good works is to include all ideas of God. Okay, and look, that being said, if somebody is going to let me preach the gospel to them, I'm still going to do it. Amen. I'm going to preach the gospel to them. But there will probably be a point where you kind of have to what? You have to do that. You have to divide. So you preach the gospel, and then you just make sure you give them that dividing line. And then look, it's up to them what they believe. You're not going to be able to force anyone to believe anything. So that's Hinduism. It's not a huge mystery you know, it's another, it's a, it's a workspace religion, it's full of idolatry, and it really pushes this same philosophies that the Buddhists and the Sikh push, because Hinduism was kind of the, the Catholic church of it, and then you had Buddhism split off, and then you had Sikhism split off, and of course, each one of their, their head, you know, it's kind of like, you know, John Calvin and, and Martin Luther. <laughs> <laughs> and each one of their, um, their heads, I mean, it, it, can't you just see the same things and all this stuff? Each one of their head gurus or whatever it was achieved that high state that, you know, for some reason no one else is going to be able to, to, to reach, right? Because it's fake. It's not real. There is nothing reaching there. There's, there's Jesus Christ, the door, and everything else is damnation. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.